Lee, if uh, the gold is God's and the silver is his and the cattle upon a thousand hills, and if he was hungry, he wouldn't tell us. Does he need the church and money from us in the church? To accomplish his purposes? Does he need our money? That seems like a first cousin to something that you talked with us about earlier and the Christian witness. Does he need our witness? Does he need our money? Can he finish his work with angels? And could he finish his work if he needs finances from his own bank account? I don't think he needs our money. So, that makes me think about the guy that um, was outside with a hundred one dollar bills and he threw them up into the air and his wife asked him what he was doing and he said, well, <clears throat> I'm just throwing this money up to God and I figure whatever he wants he can take and whatever comes back is for me. <laughs> God didn't take any of his money, is it because he doesn't need it? <clears throat> I was reading in one of our inspired books, um, whatever necessity there is for our involvement in the advancement of the Lord's uh, work, he has purposely arranged for our good. For our good. For our good. God doesn't need our money, we need to give. For our own good. And that's the same message that you gave about sharing the Christian witness, the gospel. He doesn't need our testimony, but we need to be testifying because of what it does for us. Do you, can you explain how $9 with God's blessing can go farther than $10 without it? Have you experienced it? I have experienced it, but I can't explain it. Mm. It's, it's a miracle. I think about how I've heard people say, you know, the Israelites got to see that cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night. They had tangible evidence of God actively involved in their lives. Why can't we have some kind of tangible evidence today? And the tithes and offerings for me uh, provide that very kind of tangible evidence. You asked, have I ever, have I ever seen God take nine dollars and make it go farther than ten? And I, it's almost, almost on a <laughs> daily or weekly or monthly basis that that happens. I think of one, just one example that comes to my mind. When we lived in Rocky Ford, Colorado, we were about 90 miles away from the nearest place to get any s substantial groceries. And we had to go in there quite often. And we thought, you know, it'd sure be handy if we had a freezer to where we could bring stuff back and keep it in the freezer and make fewer trips to and from the big city. And uh, so Margie and I talked about buying a freezer. The next time we went into the big city, we went to some appliance stores and we began looking at freezers and we realized real quickly that uh, with the resources that we had at our disposal, and the tuition that we were spending for our kids to be in Christian school and uh, the single income we were living on, that a freezer just wasn't going to be possible. They were far more expensive than I had imagined they could be. So we went back home with the idea we weren't going to get one. But I remember getting on my knees after we came back from the big city one morning, and I said to the Lord, you know, we don't need a freezer. It's not a salvation issue. If you don't provide us with one, we're not going to be, you know, missing out on eternity over it. But it, you have promised in Malachi to bless as we return the tithes and offerings. And if there's some way that you could provide a freezer for us in spite of our minimal income, I'm just asking. Two days later, that little paper they call the thrifty nickel or the uh, little free paper that goes around uh, came out in our community, and I was thumbing through it, and I saw freezer for sale, $50, it said. And I thought, there's got to be a mistake. 
It must have meant 500, but I thought I'll call. So I called the guy and I said, uh, you have a freezer for sale? He said, yes. I said, is it still there? He said, yes. I said, so is it $500? Is there a typo? He said, no, it's $50. There is no typo. I said, well, what's the problem? Does it work? And he said, it works great. It's out in my garage. It's sitting there running right now. You can come over and see it. It's been in my garage since I bought it new. There's no scratches on it. It works great. We're moving into a small uh, mobile home and we don't have room for it anymore. And I just wanted to unload it, basically. Come and see it. I drove over. It looked like brand new. We bought it, $50. We didn't have enough money to buy a freezer but God stretched what money we did have, and we ended up with something as good as anything we'd seen in the store for almost no money at all. <laughs> what about you? Have you any stories like that you could share? Well, if you listen to the sermon. There was a church in our town, and it was worldly wise. It tried to pay the preacher by selling cakes and pies. The uh, women made the ice cream to send the gospel far. They ladled out the oyster stew and raffled off a car. They had a harmless game of a card to make the social pay, and then a dance for timid folks who were too tired to pray. The program was a great success. From floor to lightning rod, the church has everything it needs except the grace of God. Well, I'd like to remind you that uh, God has a better plan for financing his work than raffling off cars. Let's notice it as we uh, proceed. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness, the world, and those who dwell therein. And another one, Haggai 2, verse 8. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And then this one that I've already referred to, Psalm 50, verse 10 to 12. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. <clears throat> I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all the fullness. So, there it is. And we've already pointed out that uh, God does not need our money. <clears throat> now, is God selfish when he says, this is all mine, this is mine, this is mine? Is he selfish? I suppose the devil would try to make that kind of charge. But the cross proved once and for all that God is not selfish. And that he is the creator who uh, is unselfish and who cares far more than only his self-interests. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, we're told that God gives the power to get wealth and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish the covenant which he swore to your fathers to this day. So if someone does get wealthy, it was God who gave that power. He um, demonstrated this more than once in biblical times with people who could handle it. But for uh, rich or poor, he has something that is for our benefit, and that is the tithe. Let's notice Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. The Lord is Lord. Um, the tithe, you check it out and what it means, it means one-tenth, one-tenth. 
Well, what was the purpose of the tithe with uh, God's plan back there? Numbers 18, verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an uh, inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Now the people called the Levites were the ministry. They were the ones that performed the ministry in uh, the camp of Israel back at that time. This is not just an Old Testament thing. It is also a New Testament thing. Matthew 23, verse 23. <clears throat> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done without leaving the other undone. So um, even though he emphasized some of the greater qualities, he said, don't leave the tithing undone. And in the New Testament, Paul made it clear that the tithe was for the purpose of supporting the ministry. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offering of the altar? Even as the Lord has uh, com commanded those who are preach the gospel, should live by the gospel. Commanded that they do so. So Old Testament, New Testament, we have the tithe that was God's purpose for supporting his work, particularly in terms of the ministry and the leaders in his work. <clears throat> now, some people have gotten the idea that they can do with their tithe what they please. They can choose to put it here or there or another place. I had a doctor in my congregation one time who um, chose to uh, appropriate his own tithe. He didn't bring it to the church. He was uh, supporting some mission station. He was helping a medical student through school, uh, several different things. And uh, <clears throat> I heard about it and we had a talk one night. And uh, I asked him about his relationship with God. We were talking underneath a street light until midnight out in front of the church. And I can remember him saying to me, um, well, my problem is that uh, you're a mystic and I'm a cynic. And I don't know about uh, giving either, he said. Um, but I, I don't have a relationship with God. And uh, when it comes to giving, I take care of appropriating my own money. He went home that night and he had a burden that if God wanted him to be a mystic, that he <laughs> could be. So he climbed up in the mountain behind his place. He lived in the country. And he found a rock and he sat on the rock and decided he would stay there until he could have the sense of God's presence and that it would be real. And he sat there <clears throat> until very late and uh, finally, in discouragement, he went down and went to bed. It wasn't very long after that that he woke up suddenly and he said the whole room was filled with God's presence. He could not explain it, but he could not deny it. And the next day he determined that he would uh, pay a second tithe. He would continue what he was doing with the first tithe, but he would pay a second tithe that would go to the Lord. And immediately, his practice <clears throat> went up and stayed up. And uh, he didn't lose anything at all. It was a very interesting experience. So uh, we uh, noticed that, as we've already read, <clears throat> where should the tithe go? Malachi 3, 8 to 11. <clears throat> Will a man rob God? Ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. For ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have uh, robbed even the whole nation. Then he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Where? Bring them into the storehouse. Well, what is the storehouse? Notice Nehemiah 13 verse 12. 
Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. To the storehouse. Nehemiah 10, verse 38. Another one. The Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithe to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. And uh, there's another word that's used in the margin, the treasury. So uh, the tithe were supposed to come to the storehouse or the treasury of the church. Well, some people say, I have uh, paid tithe, but I have become disenchanted with the way the funds are handled. And uh, I feel that probably money is misappropriated by leaders. I can't trust them. Uh, may I remind you of one of the greatest misappropriation of money that ever happened. The people of Israel were dancing around a golden calf. Where did the gold come from? It came from the ingathering campaign back in Egypt. And the people ended up drinking the tithe, if you please. A definite misappropriation of funds. And it happened at Mount Sinai. Well, there's an exciting thing about this whole business. In our interview, we heard about having fun with God. I'd like to invite you to have some fun and tell God that you will give him all unexpected money that comes into you this year. Would you do that? All unexpected money. I had a woman in my church who did that one time. In fact, I told you about her the other night. She's the one that met me at the door and said, it'll be a wonderful day when you get to know Jesus. And one year she said, Lord, I'll give, I'll give you all unexpected money this year. And you couldn't believe the money that began coming in. People who had owed her money for 10 years, here came the money. So much money came in that she said, Lord, do I have to all of this? And uh, she kept her pledge. I, I call that having fun with God. Wouldn't that be fun? Try it. It could be a lot of fun. And then Jesus tells us through the prophet, test me. Prove me now. Test me. This is an interesting challenge. It's one of the few times, if not the only time, where God says, look, test me. I don't care what your motive is. Test me. I'm giving you that opportunity and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Now, uh, it would be great to have the right motive, but even if you have the wrong motive, we can test him. And people have done that. A friend of mine was driving down the San Joaquin Valley in uh, California. It was a hot summer day. His little boy was with him. His boy wanted some ice cream. So he pulled over, saw an ice cream stand. He gave the boy a dime. The boy went over to the stand and pretty soon he came back crying. He says, what's the matter? He said, uh, he won't sell me an ice cream cone. Uh, by the way, this was several years ago. <laughs> he won't sell me an ice cream cone. My friend got out of the car and went over and said, well, what's the problem? Why don't you sell my son an ice cream cone? The man said, uh, he wanted a nine cent ice cream cone. I don't sell nine cent ice cream cones. My friend smiled. He said, oh, he said, uh, he's a Christian and uh, he believes in one tenth of his money going to the Lord. So uh, that's why he did that. <laughs> the man said, uh, is that what it's all about? He said, uh, here, keep your money, and I'll show you an ice cream cone. And he piled it on, three scoops. <laughs> and that boy found out that God had opened the windows of heaven. <laughs> you believe that God can bless ice cream? Maybe even German chocolate cake. <laughs> when he says to test him, he is giving us an opportunity to depend upon him. And here we come to a key factor. 
in this whole thing. Dependence, surrender and dependence. And uh, this is what God is really looking for in our lives. In Matthew 19, we have the story of the rich young single. We uh, usually call him the rich young ruler. I call him the rich young single. How do I know he was single? <clears throat> because he was rich. <laughs> he came to Jesus because there was a great void in his life and uh, said, what must I do? And Jesus said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. Now it looks at first glance that this parable or this experience is about money, uh, but it isn't. It isn't about money. It must be some way that it applies to all of us. I understand that money talks, and the last thing it said to me was bye-bye. <laughs> but uh, there are other factors than money when it comes to this question of dependence. See, some people depend upon money, so God is basically saying, get rid of it. Get rid of the money? Yeah, if you're depending on it, get rid of it. If you don't depend on it, then you can keep it. Abraham was able to keep his, Job, because they didn't depend on it. So uh, what are the other factors? Let's say that I am a very intelligent person, and so I depend upon my smarts, and uh, God says, get rid of it. What do you mean, get rid of it? And get rid of your dependence on it. Some people depend upon their good looks. Every time they look in the mirror, they're overwhelmed with how good looking they are. And uh, God says, get rid of it. You mean get rid of your good looks? No, get rid of your dependence upon your good looks. Talent, you name it. God says, if you cannot depend on it, then I want you to keep it. But if you're going to depend upon it instead of me, then you better get rid of it. This is the lesson. This is the issue. And in the end, this says that this man went away sorrowful, for he had <clears throat> great riches. This was uh, one of the most foolish men who ever lived. He might have been the disciple that took Judas's place, because Jesus longed after this rich young man. And... Uh, but he went away, he went away. I wonder how Jesus felt. Have you ever liked somebody that didn't like you? I've had that experience. <clears throat> I liked Elaine, but she liked Joe. <laughs> and uh, it hurt. I suppose most of us have had that kind of experience, even the most uh, striking and attractive people. Sometime or another, liking somebody who didn't like you. But can you imagine Jesus liking us when we don't like him? Even we are his enemies and he still loves us. What a tremendous testimony to the love of God. Now there are people who have chosen not to pay tithe. <clears throat> there have been studies made in our own church. And uh, these studies have proven that um, a little more than 50% pay tithe. Those who don't pay tithe are showing a lack of faith. They are showing ignorance and poor judgment, they are. Because if they've done their homework, they know that it's only an ignorant person who would follow that approach. And we come to this major premise again, that $9 with God's blessing goes far more or much further than $10 without his blessing. It was my first year in the ministry. <clears throat> I didn't have uh, much money. I had $32 a week for my income. 
I lived in an apartment. I had to make a uh, car payment. I didn't have any furniture. Uh, there was an old refrigerator that I got out of the junkyard for $10. And it went wonk, 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 wonk. And it became my friend. I kind of enjoyed the sound. <laughs> Someone gave me an old iron bedstead that they didn't want anymore. And I had a card table for a desk. That was it. And I was single. And that's a terrible experience. Because when you're single and in the ministry, all the old hens want to marry you off to their young chicks. <laughs> so you get invited over for dinner. And uh, just before you're ready to leave, they bring out their daughter from the back room who just happened to be home that day. And then you tell them you have a <clears throat> pressing appointment you have to make. And so you go your way. And then people invite you over for supper and then they invite you over for breakfast. And uh, <clears throat> it's a miserable life being <laughs> single in the ministry. But one month, <clears throat> I had some extra expense and I ran short. I had put my tithe in an envelope and I had it on my card table desk. And uh, I didn't have enough money to buy food for the rest of the month. So I decided I would take the tithe and pay it back later. And then I remembered reading about natives in a foreign country who uh, raised their crops, you know, and they have set aside one-tenth of their crops, their harvest, for the Lord. And when the uh, missionaries would come through their area, they would descend it with them back to the headquarters. Then one year, they had a terrible famine, and the crops failed. They still had some of their tithes set aside and they were tempted to use it, but they didn't. Here they were going hungry and refusing to touch the food that they could have touched. And I had read that story. So uh, I said, no, I, I'm not gonna do that. I said, if I go hungry, okay, Lord, uh, I'll leave it up to you. The next day, a funeral chapel called up and they said, uh, we understand that you sing solos. Well, I don't sing solos that well. Uh, a duet covers a multitude of sins, uh, <laughs> but solos. <clears throat> so I went and sang for a funeral and they gave me $15. And uh, <clears throat> a few days later, another funeral chapel called up. I understand you sing solos, yes. I went there, and they gave me some money for my singing. A third time before the month was over, the same thing happened again. And I had enough to live on and to eat, and I was never asked to sing another solo after that. Now, here comes the crunch. When we pay tithe, we are not being generous, we're only being honest. We are returning the rent for living on this planet, and we are not generous until we begin giving offerings. And this is why Malachi said, wherein have you robbed me? You have robbed me in tithes, and offerings. And for this reason, they were cursed with a curse. Wow. So we are invited to now be generous with the Lord. And this can take some extra faith. I know of some people, and I've tried it myself, who give a second tithe in offerings offerings. And uh, if you try it, you'll discover that no one can outgive God. There have been some who have tried it. 
but it, it can't be done. We have some of the uh, great uh, people in business who have tested God. Uh, the one that I think of most is J.C. Penney, you know, how he started out and how he paid tithes, and he ended up going up to 50% he was paying God. And God blessed him and has still blessed J.C. Penney to this day. So even though people have tried it, it is impossible to outgive God. Now, uh, how much offering is worthwhile? We better notice this one about the little widow. Mark 12, verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in the two mites, which make a farthing. So he called his disciples to him and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow hath put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. She, they put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in all of her livelihood. Two mites. How much is that? My father traveled in the Holy Land back in the 1930s, and he came home with uh, some mites. <laughs> Money. <laughs> I can remember looking at them. A mite was worth one-tenth of a cent. One-tenth of a cent. She put in two mites. Jesus saw her. And with approval in his eyes, he must have given her courage because she must have seen him. And Jesus said he, she put in more than all. What does this story tell you? That our gift is measured not by how much we give, but by how much we have left after we've given. I've had people tell me I, uh, I don't have uh, much cash flow, so I can't give that much, <clears throat> but they have great possessions. Great possessions. I had a doctor in Seattle <clears throat> tell me after a meeting we had up there one time where we were emphasizing depending upon God instead of ourselves, and without him we can do nothing. He said, your uh, pitch isn't gonna sell. He said, I am a successful physician. I have a nice home in the city. I have a home in the country. I have a yacht in the harbor. I have three cars in the garage. <clears throat> Don't tell me I can do nothing. I said, uh, who keeps your heart beating, doctor? <clears throat> and they got kind of quiet. We know who keeps our hearts beating. He had great possessions. So God measures it by how much we have left after we have given. And the truth is that she gave more than all the rest because the influence of her example has come down through the ages. And people who had little to give have gone ahead and given and have therefore swelled the treasury. So it is reality and it's an actual fact that uh, she gave more than all the rest of them. Now here's a principle where your treasure is, Matthew 6, verse 21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Sounds backwards. It seemed like it would be where your heart is, there will your treasure be. No. God, didn't you get that twisted around? No. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I suppose you've heard about the wealthy woman who had a dream. 
She dreamed that she went to heaven and the angel was taking her to her place that God had prepared for her. As they were going along, they passed a beautiful mansion. Just everything about it was outstanding. She said, uh, Who, whose is that? That's your washerwoman's. That's where she lived. They kept going. And finally, they ended up in front of the wealthy woman's house. Just a tiny little thing. No flowers, nothing. She said, how do you explain that? My washerwoman with that mansion and me with this. The angel said, uh, this is all we could do with what you sent up. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it works. Nicodemus was a wealthy man. We know that. He came and talked to Jesus by night. Jesus uh, dropped a few interesting points that uh, lodged in his heart and Jesus left him alone. Seems to me that some of us would have been anxious to get Nicodemus in the baptismal pool by the following week. He left him alone. And for almost three years, Nicodemus pondered in his heart about the things that Jesus had told him. And then Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And when he was, Nicodemus remembered. And we understand that he uh, gave his possessions to the church, to God's work, all of them, until he became a poor man. Poor in this world's goods. But uh, his heart had been touched by divine grace. I heard a sermon one time about a, the poor rich man and the rich poor man. The poor rich man was a man who had a big barn and he was also a fool. Remember, decided to tear down his barn and build bigger. He was a fool because that night his life was required. Actually, the uh, rich, poor person was the widow. The widow. But uh, Nicodemus qualifies also. He became poor in this world's goods because he had caught words from 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, which are a very impressive. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes... He became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. We trade places with him. How poor was he? He was so poor, he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He slept on the ground night after night with his disciples. And he even said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not a place to lay his head. The poorest of the poor. But because of his sacrifice, we can be rich. Rich in heaven's graces and rich in faith. I invite you, neighbor, to listen carefully to the words of God on giving. And also remember what I told you a while back about John Bunyan, who said, there was a man, and some did count him mad. The more he gave away, the more he had.
And once it was broken and spilled out, a fragrance filled all the room, like a prisoner. That song, broken and spilled out and wasted for me, and Dad's reference to Nicodemus, it just pulls a story I, I want to tell you before I pray. In 1996, we were in the Holy Lands, and we had the privilege of touring the places that Jesus had been. And what a privilege it is and was to walk where he had walked. But there was this one fly in the ointment, and that was wherever we went, there were people who were begging for money to see this or that thing that supposedly had some connection. One dollar, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar. Everyone wanted one dollar, one dollar. They turned a shrine. Everything had been turned into a shrine. You couldn't go anywhere 
where Jesus had been without a shrine there and somebody trying to get money out of it. And that sort of tainted the experience. It was a joy to go out on the Sea of Galilee because they couldn't put a shrine over the lake. But after spending two weeks in the Holy Lands and having people ask for a dollar here and a dollar there everywhere I turned around, we finally came to Jerusalem. And there are two places that are reported to be um, the burial spot of Jesus, one inside the city and one outside of the city. The one outside the city is known as the Garden Tomb. There's a very interesting story associated with it. Uh, many years ago, early 1900s, uh, some people from London found this spot that they believed was actually the garden tomb owned by Nicodemus. And there are a number of reasons that indicate that that's probably true. I personally believe it after having studied the evidence they provide there. They went back to England and they asked people to help them buy that property so that they could excavate and um, make that spot a sacred spot for Christians around the world to come to. They ran an ad in the newspaper asking for people to help with the cost of this project, and they promised something. They said, never will we ask for any money of any person to come and see that spot. We just want it to be a place where folks who love Jesus can have a special sense of his presence as they see the spot that he vacated when he came forth victorious. People paid for it. And for decades now, these folks have made this spot available. No charge. You can go there, no charge. They don't try to make any money off of you. In fact, they provide you with things. They give you mementos to remember the place by. They provide spots where you can sit and meditate quietly under the trees and look at that empty tomb. They let you go in there, and as you go in, they don't ask you for anything. In fact, they recite John 3.16 before you walk in. They remind you that Jesus was broken and spilled out. Then you go in the tomb there and you see the place where he lay. And you see that there's only one place that's been carved out, just one. The rest of the tomb is room. There's room for more. It was a family tomb, but there's only one place that was carved out. And it's been empty for 2,000 years. And I stood there in that tomb. And I looked at the place where he lay. And I imagined him cold and still, his body swollen, bruised and broken. I imagined the blood trickling and coagulating. I imagined the cold hands folded in death, the hands that had touched people, the feet that had walked to assistance, the lips that had spoken encouragement. I imagined him there still on that slab. Then I heard someone come in while I was standing in the shadows looking. And I heard them say to someone else as they looked at the same spot I was looking at, they said, well, it's just as I expected, they said. He's not here. <laughs> he's not here. And I said, praise God, he's not here. But praise God, he was here. And I walked out of that place. And I was so moved. I was so moved, and I thought, I've got to find somebody and give them some money. I want to help sustain this thing. I went and I looked for somebody that looked like they worked there, and I said, I'd like to give some money to you. I think it's so neat what you're doing to make this spot available without charge. And I just want to help pay for your expenses. They said, sir, it's nice of you to want to do that, but we're not set up to receive donations. This is all provided. We just want you to have a blessed experience. But, you know, thank you for wanting to. I said, you don't understand. 
you may not need my money, but I need to give it to you. And I started to weep. And she said, well, <clears throat> I could try to find a, an administrator and see that it got put into the proper fund if you'd like to give it to me. I reached into my pocket. I had a roll of bills. I reached in with the intent of peeling some of them off and giving them to her. But as I pulled it out of my hand, I mean, out of my pocket, suddenly I thought this. Jesus didn't just peel off a little bit and leave it behind. He gave everything he had. And I just stood in the tomb where he lay after he gave the final sacrifice. How can I count the money in my hand? And I took my hand and I put it over her hand and I put it in there and I closed her fist over my money and I said, you just take it, you take it all. A beautiful principle was demonstrated to me right then and there. I've never forgotten. We can beg people for money in the Christian church, but if we will lift Jesus up, people will want to give without ever even being asked because there's something about Jesus that empties us of ourselves. He emptied Nicodemus. He emptied me that moment in Gethsemane. I pray he empties me on a daily basis. Will you join me as we pray? Thank you, Jesus, for being broken and spilled out, poured out in sweet abandon for us. Thank you for the worthy example of Nicodemus and the little woman who gave everything she had. Forgive us for being stingy and miserly. Teach us to depend upon you more and to trust you more. Crowd self out of our hearts and make us more like you who did not consider it degrading to leave heaven on a costly mission. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. We look forward to seeing you in person and casting our crowns at your feet. In Jesus' name.